First and foremost, my heartiest congratulations for a very happy new year. I hope uh, 2023 brings you a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, a lot of prosperity and lots of privacy as well. As we embark on our journey in 2023, how about looking back at 2022 and then looking forward to 2023? That is what happened in 2022. How do we see it from a macro perspective and what do we expect to change in 2023? And who better than my dear friend, Jeff Jokish, who's a privacy researcher, privacy consultant, and a privacy expert just like me. Hello, and welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast with Punit Bhatia. This is the podcast for those who care about their privacy. Here, your host, Punit Bhatia, has conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas, and opinions relating to privacy, data protection, and related matters. Be aware that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not legal advice. Let us get started. So here we are with my friend, Jeff Jokish who's a co or fellow privacy professional. So Jeff, let's first and foremost, welcome. Welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast once more. Great. Thanks, uh, Pune. Appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. So the idea is that let's have a chat around, a conversation around how do we see the events in last one year as we have closed down 2022 by now. Uh, that is when the episode is being published and we are looking forward to 2023. So how do you see what moments do strike you from 2022 and then first focus on looking back and then we will look forward and I will chime in as well. What do you think? Well, uh, you know, I like to talk about privacy a lot. Uh, we, do it, <laughs> <laughs> we do it quite often together, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I think I sort of see this this past year as as sort of a push pull, push pull, between, yeah, between privacy efforts, um, sort of 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 surveillance capitalism trying to sort of keep chugging along, and you know privacy advocates trying to pull it back, mm -hmm. uh, and. You know, I, I, I don't know that there was any net gain or loss. Um, hmm. You know, there was a lot of privacy laws that, that sort of went into effect and some that are coming online in 2023. But I think there was also some overreaches. You know, the, the American Data uh, Privacy Protection Act didn't happen. Uh, internationally, some laws like the India Privacy Law, which would have had a big international effect, didn't quite make it across the line, right? Uh, other other laws like that didn't quite happen. Um, I mentioned right before we started here, you know, we had the big Clearview AI settlement, yeah. which you know was sort of groundbreaking in some ways, but it also feels sort of to me like a little bit of a deafening silence afterwards that it, maybe it didn't actually have much of an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, did it really impact uh, facial recognition at all? It doesn't seem like the industry even skipped a beat. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it seems like we're making some slow progress in, in data privacy and consumers waking up. But that that progress is very, very incremental. And it's sort of hard to see that we're much further in 2023, the, uh, 2022, than we were in 2021. Well, I would agree to an extent. What has happened is it has remained. I mean, one, we need to look at the macro context. The things moved from a pandemic to almost the pand pandemic in the end stage, as we call it, we can call it. Of course, nobody knows with these waves and everything. But uh, then as it moved, people were more busy into getting life back to normal than around privacy. But yes, there have been some new privacy laws. There have been some privacy laws equally anticipated. And there was, of course, this debate in the UK around 
what direction do they want to go? Do they really want to deviate from the GDPR? Do they want to really be innovative and creative? Do they want to be business friendly or maybe all of that? Of course, my personal guess is they want to do all of that, but positioning, branding it as the business friendly aspect or dimension. And then in the EU, the debate around the AI and privacy, because with the AI Act coming up and the Digital Services Act or, uh, coming up, and yes, in the in Indian context or in the Chinese context, we had the law. In the Indian context, we didn't. In US, we did have the uh, ADPA discussion and it looked like it'll come, but it didn't. But we have the positive news. We were talking to one of the EU professionals, uh, EU leaders last week, and he was mentioning you can expect the transatlantic data protection adequacy treaty by spring 2023 which is a positive so it has been mixed the noise around is privacy relevant or privacy is relevant these companies are running away with our data has continued uh, the action on new privacy laws has remained but of course a lot of us are disappointed because we wanted more we wanted yeah. more things but it has kept us busy it's kept people busy and i think there has been more awareness on privacy than before, if I look at it from there. Because there have been some interesting fines as well, if we see. I mean, recently the meta fine, if we call it like that. Yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of those, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I won't say a lot, but yes, some depends. I mean, the big ticket funds, a few, and we don't need a lot anyhow. To change behavior, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like somebody is not driving a car and uh, driving the car well and you have put the security cameras and you want a lot of photos to be clicked. Well, I don't want a lot of photos to be clicked. I want people to be driving safely. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I, I do think that, that, that for the most part, corporations are, have woken up to the fact that privacy is important. Right. Yes. And and they're changing behavior. And that is a a huge shift. So I don't want to say that that privacy, data privacy hasn't had any real impact. I do think that some of the surveillance capitalism models haven't changed appreciably. But for for brands, um, I think they've wake, woken up and are, are changing how they do business. So mm -hmm. that's actually a pretty, pretty large shift. Um, maybe data brokers were, you know, I focus a lot of my research. I don't think they've changed a whole lot yet. I think they're very resistant to, 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 um, to the new privacy laws, right? Trying to sort of get around what's going on there. Maybe that's, Absolutely. maybe that's why I sort of see less change based upon what's going on here. And when you talk about the surveillance capitalism, uh, one of the theories that has been talked about is intrusive home surveillance or intrusive surveillance, because what happened in the pandemic was everybody was working from home. Then uh, you don't have the control over what's happening compared to what a manager could do in uh, the premises. And then some tools or some systems were built in uh, in terms of controlling the PC or controlling the person, whichever way you want to see it. I mean, from the organization perspective, saying making security, it's secure from some people's perspective, you'll say it's intrusive. That has been a little bit too much and it hasn't gone back, even though we've come back more or less from pandemic. Of course, now it's a hybrid model. Some days you work from home, some days you work from office, but that intrusion or that surveillance hasn't rolled back. It is not anymore that when I put this device in the network of the company, it's different set of uh, controls. And when I put it in my home, then it's extra controls. It's rather the extra controls at both places. What do, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I've, I'm actually sort of surprised there hasn't been more pushback um, against that sort of intrusive employee surveillance um, in the home, um, mm -hmm. you know, home office, I guess. Um, and I think that, I think that really the change is going to come when we start to realize that some of those systems that we're using for security can actually be 
taken over and, and sort of co-opted by the bad guys, even though we want to use them for, for surveillance, you know, on the good side. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting problem, Punit. I'm not sure how we solve that because it's, no, no. it's, it's definitely a side, you know, uh, a side issue to, to consumer privacy. Employee privacy has a whole lot of other, issues wrapped up in it right because you're not just a consumer now you've got to actually worry about your employment at the same time right you don't want to push back too hard um against that right and, and in the united states we've got all these right to work laws so you push back maybe you don't have a job yeah and i think then if we'll shift the gear and look at more of the fines or the what do you say these uh, actions from authorities, especially in the EU. I mean, the CNIL ha came down on Google Ireland in context of the consent procedures on YouTube and I, I think fined 90 euro million euros. Facebook was fined about 60 millions again by CNIL for cookie consent, which kind of put a lot of focus on cookie consent. Then we had the Garante coming on NL Energia and I think that was also 25 million plus on the telemarketing calls. Then you mentioned already Clear AI is 20 million. Then Meta's another fine of 17 million in March. And then the Spanish authority coming to on Google uh, again with 10 million. So I think more or less that activity has concentrated on the big tech and trying to put the things in order, though I don't think those fines have had too much of an impact, at least not in the short term. Maybe in the long term, we will see some impact. Do you see some changes in the behaviors in the way companies are collecting data because of those fines? Well, maybe a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think they may be slowly changing the business models. There's mm -hmm. a new ruling out. I mean, it's not final yet, but I don't know if you saw the European um, uh, Data Protection Board released, uh, well, they sent the decision back to the Irish, uh, um, yeah. right, about Meta's um, use of the uh, uh, TOS to get consent, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was a, a, a NOIB complaint that Max Schrems filed, like, right uh, back uh, in 2018 when the GDPR first came active. Mm -hmm. They said you can't get consent from users through your terms of service, which is what <laughs> Facebook has been doing all along, saying, hey, we're gonna use personalized advertising uh, on you and you're consenting by accepting our terms of service, which- and That's grossly incorrect, you know? I mean, that's against the principles of privacy because what you're doing is you're linking your service to that action of yours while you want to be providing a basic vanilla service and then say, if you want the add-ons, then I would need your personalization or more options. I mean, imagine you being on Meta or the Facebook, uh, no personalized feeds, you're just getting random feeds. But if you allow them for personalization, you get feeds relevant to your interest. And I think most people would then allow them to do it because most people like on LinkedIn, I like to see posts from people whom I like to inspire or I like to follow or I like to see what they are doing, not random posting. It's just coming in the sequence of as it's happening. Of course, that's also relevant, but ability to choose between the two would be very useful. No. Yeah. Agency. You want that agency, right? Yeah. But forcing on you in the terms of surface is just, yeah, no, obviously, not that. yes, it's not, not going to work and they're, they're going to get in trouble for it now. Yeah. And one of the topics, the other one that has been talked about, uh, and I think you also did in your, your data, your bytes is the zero party data, the first party data, the second party data, the third party data, or whatever we call is the cookie aspect of it. And then moving away from uh, cookies, which are website based to a browser based cookie mechanism, you choose once and then what do you think? Would something change or has something changed? Of course, the debate has started. Yeah. Um... I mean, I think it's going to be pretty revolutionary mm -hmm. once, I mean, Apple's already done it, right? They've already gotten rid of the cookies. Once Google gets rid of cookies, it's going to change. Well, I hate to say that it's going to change things a lot because my guess is the industry is going to find 
a different way to uniquely identify us, right? <laughs> right now they're using the cookies in the advertising IDs to uniquely identify us. You know, Apple and Google are essentially saying, hey, we're going to create some new ways that you can, that we can uniquely identify you and we'll mm -hmm. pass that on. And hopefully that'll keep people from being able to, um, you know, transfer that demographic and other information along with those unique IDs. But you and I, and most privacy professionals agree that it's really hard to keep that data from being mm -hmm. identified, no matter how you slice and dice it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you, if, if I give you an ID of any kind, right, mm -hmm. along with 15 data points about Punit, mm -hmm. right? Even though it's mm -hmm. not tagged as Punit, right? I mm -hmm. can take those 15 data points and go to Axiom or you know, uh, Oracle or any mm -hmm. other big data provider and run it against their data sets. And I can probably find Punit, right? With those 15 data points and you yeah. identify you, right? That's true. It's just, I... it's just big data. It's just, you know, it's statistics. Indeed. And I think it's the, the the boundary between personal, non-personal, and whatever we say, the footprint of data, it's blurring. Of course, we know my name and my email and your name and your email are personal and something. Up, but there's so many things being attached to this that what exactly, apart from this, is personal and what exactly is non-personal, it is blurring so much that it's going to be an interesting a fascinating period in coming next five years or 10 years to see which direction we go because it's good to talk about privacy it's good to talk about protecting personal data but where do we draw the line on personal data because if uh, i draw the line very strictly in the sand everything is personal data why do even i need to differentiate between personal and non-personal data let's talk data and protect it yeah well you know what I'm, what i'm seeing happen too here and, and, and I guess that's maybe a trend for 2022, right? Is you're talking about, about there's not a big difference between, you know, data connected to me and personal data, right? Mm -hmm. The laws, though, are starting to also broaden the definition of sensitive yeah. personal data, right? And broaden the definition of child, right? And, and those two types of data, children's data and sensitive personal information, often require opt-in instead of opt-out, <laughs> right? Which yeah. makes it makes it you know tougher for for companies to collect that information, um, and they have to do more to protect it once they have collected it. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting. Um, it's almost as though we're we're sort of saying, instead of having to create a law that says, you know, uh, you have to opt into all personal data collection, yeah. we're instead saying, well, all this data is now sensitive, and by default, because it's sensitive data, you have to opt into it, right? Um, exactly. So it's almost like getting around that in a different way. Yeah. And another thing when I look at the privacy thing, because all the clients I work with, of course, as a contractor or a consultant or an advisor, I'm the external party and they're usually looking for staff. But it has been a challenge, a real challenge to find good quality resources, good quality people who are fit for being in the job and being able to perform adequately. And there are two challenges. One, it's good to hard to find them. And when you find a good one, they switch very quickly. So privacy resourcing or privacy skills has also been a big challenge. Uh, what do you have to say about that perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not really my, uh, well, I know less about that than, than you probably do. But I think it's a big problem. Um, to, to, there's not enough, not enough privacy professionals and, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are trying to hire high level or low level people 
Um, either they want to hire somebody who's got like, you know, 10 years of experience in privacy, or they want to hire somebody with no levels of experience. <laughs> I think there are a lot of sort of like mid-level privacy people that are sort of floating around looking for the right position. Um, but there's there's not enough of the low level people and not, a lot, not, a, not enough of the high level people. Um, there's a lot of openings in, in both of those spots. Indeed, I think what the challenge has been uh, that it has the industry has expanded so fast and the skill or the pool of skilled people has not expanded that much. And then, uh, then uh, there's always a shortage of good people. Now, you can always find people when you uh, put in a job posting and want to interview them, you get a lot of requests. But filtering out good people and retaining good people has been a challenge because most of my business is around helping people strategize, set the privacy program or conduct an assessment, and then of course, get them to privacy operations. But more and more what I'm seeing is people want to work with us in privacy operations because they can't find the right people. And of course it's good for my business, but from a industry perspective, there is where the real uh, action is. If somebody wants to become truly good, knowledgeable privacy professional, there's a lot of opportunity over there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's yeah. true. Um, the only other thing that I guess I would add there is, is I see a lot of people that have not, you know, th there's probably a lack of experience in, 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 in doing uh, compliance work right. for, for what companies are, are looking for. But the people that they do have in compliance work often sort of lack a lot of the strategic vision of what's actually going on outside of this, the, the compliance work. And there's not a lot of overlap between the strategy and the compliance areas. Uh, it's hard to find people that have both. Right? Indeed. And I think the strategic perspective and even one level above looking at privacy from a business perspective and being able to articulate privacy from business perspective and then take that articulation, what you discuss with your senior executive and implement it in privacy. That's where the gap has been, but we all know that. And that's the 2022 perspective, but we'll look at 2023 or beyond. What do you see changing or what are the top things that you see changing in the next 12 months or so? You know, I haven't really, probably thought about that hard enough. Um, I can see some, some. I don't know about for the job market. I have to think about that a little bit. There, mm -hmm. there is an interesting trend that, that I'm seeing in some of the research that I'm doing. Granted, I've been, you know that I do a lot of research on, on data yeah. brokers, right? And <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any any shortage of data brokers and, and more and more of them pop up all the time. Mm -hmm. but. But adjacent to that, I've been tracking a lot of, uh, of what I call privacy agents, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you know about this, but I don't know if the, the audience will, right? And that is organizations that are trying to help consumers opt out of data brokers yeah. services, right? Uh, to sort of like help automate them submitting DSAR requests, whether it's right. information requests or, or opt out requests or do not sell requests. And there were like a couple of companies that were doing it. Now there's like 30, uh, at least 20. Um, and I'm sort of tracking them. And some of them are sort of nascent. Some of them are getting big. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are a little annoying, <laughs> depending <laughs> on your perspective, right? Um, but there are more and more of them. And I, I find a couple of new ones every week. And so I don't know whether that means they're, the market's going to get oversaturated. Uh, or what, you know, some of them seem to be services that are popping up based upon data brokers sort of opening up their own sort of wing to try to, I don't know, to capitalize on this. And some of them are, you know, privacy advocates trying to do really cool new stuff. And some of them are, you know, sort of venture funded. So it, they're coming from all different angles, which is, is really interesting. Um, but everyone seems to want to get onto this privacy bandwagon in, in this particular niche market. And I think we're going to see lots of that happening in other markets too. There's still a lot of money being invested in privacy. Um, and I see a lot of money getting invested in privacy tech as well. This is just one sort of like 
yeah. offshoot, right? Um, probably much more getting invested in, you know, computing tech, um, because I think that's actually more where we're going to make big strides. When I start to think about how we're going to solve a lot of these privacy problems, you know, there's legislators and there's, you know, things that we can do with business models. But I think that privacy technology is actually going to enable more of the gains that we make in consumer privacy protection than maybe either of those other two things, right? Absolutely. And I think one is the rise of the privacy tech, the rise of privacy investments, also maybe more jobs. But I will also imagine more intersection with other things because when the privacy came in, people said, let's set up a privacy department. When AI came in, they said, let's set up an AI department. But I'm expecting some consolidation on those things also, because people would like to put these as strategic differentiators and rather than as uh, uh, just separate functions. So a lot of overlap and collaboration amongst these uh, data function, privacy function, compliance function, your AI function and so on. But maybe that will not happen in 2023. Uh, the other thing is, of course, there will be few more laws. I hope uh, UK will get through with some direction on which direction they want to go. The uh, EU-US uh, adequacy will come through. I also hope India decides on which direction they want to go because they've been talking for a few years on the data protection bill or personal data protection bill, and it has pivoted, shifted a bit. And uh, I think uh, we will still continue to talk about cookies I don't expect it to be solved, but that'll be on the wish list if it gets solved this year. Yeah, I think I think that we're going to have to deal with with this this uh, consent spam issue. Yeah, um, and eventually we're going to have to deal with the whole notice and consent framework. True. You know, it, it's not it's not working, right? We have to figure out some way to either fix it or or go a different direction. Um, I think that consent has to play a part in the solution, but we have to fix the consent framework because it's just not working the way it's working. No. You can't you can't continue to to click yes. It's not just a binary yes or no e equation when that question that you're asking a consumer is a complicated one that they don't understand all the all the pieces of, right? When I walk, when I go to Facebook and they ask me if they can share my information in return for what I'm getting from them. That's mm -hmm. a really complicated question. And it either just a yes or a no. <laughs> and then it's hard to change that 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 decision, right? It has to be more than just a binary decision that I make once and can't easily change again. I think so. And I, I've seen in some cases. I won't name, uh, but on some websites you are there and it sends you some personalized information and saying, would you like us to send you this kind of information in future? And by the way, you can change it in the settings later on if you want. And you say yes, and then it will show you that personalized, but you have had an experience and it's contextual then. And then also the option of opting in and even changing it later on. Of course, it's very hard to find a way to change later on. I yeah. agree. But that would be the right way to do it. So practically speaking, would you expect something magical, transformative, or radically different in 2023? <laughs> no, I think we'll probably have some surprises. You know, I think there'll be some law or laws that pop up that uh, mm -hmm. that that are interesting. Um, I, I'm not going to speculate on where or when. But uh, we'll have some interesting things that'll pop up that'll that'll surprise us. We'll probably have some some big fines uh, and some big data breaches that'll scare the crap out of us, mm -hmm. um, or scare the crap out of some companies. But I don't really expect that we're going to have significant changes in data privacy that really change the landscape. Um, at least, you know, it, it's going to be incremental change overall, right? We might, we might say, wow, you know, this is going to be groundbreaking, but you know, we thought when, when Clearview, that Clearview AI settlement happened, right? Everybody's like, mm -hmm. wow, right? 
Mm -hmm. what, what did it really change? Did it really change all that much? You know? So I I'm think not sure. I'm not we'll have a good conversation in 2024 because I think if the UK data protection uh, changes or regular uh, landscape changes as they want to change, that may set the scene for some things to change in future because they have having some, I mean, from one perspective, they are saying the same thing and uh, without having it obligatory. But on the other hand, they are putting the accountability on the organization a little bit more than what it is right now. So if that goes through, I think it can be transformative, but that's then we know in 2024 when we've gone through 23. So that already sets us that we will probably have another episode looking back and looking forward. But at this moment, I would say, Jeff, as always, wonderful to have a conversation with you, free flowing and truly a conversation. So thank you so much. Take care. It was wonderful chatting, Punit. Thanks for listening. If you liked the show, feel free to share it with a friend and write a review. If you have already done so, thank you so much. And if you did not like the show, don't bother and forget about it. Take care and stay safe. Fit for Privacy helps you to create a culture of privacy and manage risks by creating, defining, and implementing a privacy strategy that includes delivering scenario-based training for your staff. We also help those who are looking to get certified in CIPPE, CIPM, and CIPT through on-demand courses that help you prepare and practice for certification exam. Want to know more? Visit www fitforprivacy.com. That's www.fit, the number four, privacy.com. If you have questions or suggestions, drop an email at hello at fitforprivacy.com. Until next time, goodbye.